Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you because of your grace. We thank you because you've given us your word to reveal that grace to us. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the preachers whom you have sent to be able to declare unto us. Father, we are asking that as you are teaching us your word, your word in Jesus' name. I will pray that you'll help us to stand by the truth of your word so that the grace that you have revealed in your word will work mightily in Jesus' name. Help us to take you seriously, to take your word seriously, and to keep to all the things that you are teaching us. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. In the study of the Bible, we come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, a passage of scripture that is very, very deep indeed in its record. It's an eye opener on the things that happened in the early church and the things that still continue to happen in the church today. We praise the Lord because he has not left us in darkness as to what he wants us to do, the attitude he wants us to have on the word of God and on the teachers that teach the word of God. In the world in which we live, many things are played down and many serious things sometimes are handled in a very careless manner. This has affected the church worldwide. And as you have become a believer, you would have noticed that in various churches, in various places of worship, sometimes there are things that are very, very serious that are taken with light hands. And this attitude has affected not only just a few churches, but the majority of the churches in our nation, in our continent, and in the world. And if we are not very observant and vigilant, that same attitude will affect us in our worship, in our reading of the Bible, in our standing on the truth of the Word of God. Many people come to this situation in their lives where, as Christians, they do not know where they stand, what they stand on. All they know is that Jesus Christ came to the cross of Calvary, shed his blood, and by that today we can be saved. How we keep saved, how we remain in the fold, how we remain on the truth of the word of God, they do not know. They are ignorant. In fact, they do not want to know. And there are many churches that have this attitude. They tell their church members this same attitude. And they have what they call an attitude of tolerance. They tolerate everything from false doctrine to sin. Everything from worldliness to carnality. Everything from the true preachers to the false preachers. They tolerate everything and everyone. And when they see a teacher of the word of God that will stand on the unchanging word of God, they'll bring an accusation and they'll say, oh, that man, he needs a prayer. He doesn't tolerate other people. He doesn't tolerate anything that is different from what he believes. He just stands on just one thing and he doesn't want to know any other thing. And this has been spoken of in many places to such a point that sincere believers now might even be shaking, might be trembling because of the misunderstanding of people that do not know the truth of the word of God. But I want to tell you as your pastor and as your teacher that the word of God has given us 
the entire doctrines we ought to stand upon. And whenever there is false doctrine being preached by a false teacher, whether that false teacher is within the fold or outside the fold, the Bible makes us to understand that we cannot tolerate evil or false doctrine. Of course, we are to act in an attitude of law. We are to seek to correct an erring brother, a false teacher, in an attitude of law. But the love there, the grace there, the spirit of God there, we are still to come back to the foundation of the truth of the word of God. And in what you hear from the word of God today, I want you to keep your ears open. And I want you to see what the Bible has written. Now, there may be people here who are not members of Deeper Christian Life Ministry. I congratulate you. I appreciate the fact that you're seeking for the truth. I believe that's the reason you are here. You wouldn't be giving hours of your time. To come to a church where you are not a member if you are not looking for something real. And I always rejoice when I find pastors in other churches coming to Monday Bible study saying, I'm not part of Deeper Christian Life Ministry, but I want to enlighten myself. I want to grow. I want to come up to maturity. And I just like to share the word of God with children of God. If you are like that and you are here tonight, I praise God for you. But understand this, that you are hearing something tonight as a pastor and you are responsible for what you are hearing. I'm not inviting you as a pastor to necessarily, compulsorily become a part of deeper Christian life ministry, but I am challenging you that the truth you hear the truth you study in this place, you go back to those innocent sheep, willing sheep, wanting to learn the truth of the word of God from you as their pastor and teach them the whole counsel of God. Stand by the truth. Stand for the truth. Even if you have to stand alone in the church you belong to, stand and the grace of God will be sufficient for you. Now, if you are not a pastor and you just came here tonight, a member of another church, but you have heard that Monday is a study day in deeper life, and Monday happens to be a free day in your church, and you are here tonight, there's something within you searching for the truth. The Spirit of God within you is leading you, directing you, telling you, don't stay at the place where you are at the plane, at the level where you are. There is something higher. There is something greater. There is something that you have not known. Keep on seeking. Keep on until you find. And you are not here tonight by accident. It is that spirit of God that knows how sincere you are. That knows how deeply serious you are wanting to know the entire truth of the Bible that has brought you here tonight. When you hear what you hear, Oh, don't say, well, that's not my church, that's not my pastor. Let them say what they want to say. I know what I believe at that point to show that you are not serious again. You ran here appearing to look for the truth. Then the truth came and then all of a sudden you drew back. You said, can I take that? Can I stand on that? Will I be able to go through with that? Now press on. If the Spirit of God has led you here, then open your ears, open your eyes, and whatever the Lord wants to teach you, give the Lord the chance to teach you. Now let me show you from the Word of God before I go to Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, how God seriously counts the doctrines of the Bible. In First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16.
Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Take heed unto the doctrine. Study the doctrine. Meditate on the doctrine. Stand on the doctrine. Defend the doctrine. Make sure that you know what you are standing on, you know what you are preaching. And then make sure that you know what you are giving to other people. Because it's only in so doing, you'll be able to save yourself and save the people that listen to you. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You find that that has happened already in very many places. That today it is very, very difficult to find a teacher of the word of God in many denominational circles preaching the word. The time has come when even the church members, the religious people, they are not waiting, they are not watching for sound doctrine. But they just want teachers that will tickle them. Teachers that will make them laugh, make them happy in their sin, in their evil. Teachers that will tell jokes in their sermons. Teachers that will tell stories and fables. They are turning their ears away from the truth. But the Lord is saying, when that time has come, you make sure that in your own life, you are standing by the truth. In Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. How serious God must be about his word. I'm sure that if you're a sincere fellow yourself, if you're a father in a family, and you want to have a family that is well taught, well disciplined, well behaved, you're serious about your word as a father in the family, as a mother in the family. You want your children to take you seriously when you talk in your company as a manager. You want the employees to take you serious when you talk as a teacher in a school, as a principal in a school. Whenever you declare anything in the assembly, you want the children, the students to take you serious. Because if they do not take your word serious, they are not taking your personality serious. And God as Father, God as Creator, God as the beginning and the ending, God as the all-knowing God, almighty God, all-sufficient God, all-powerful God, he takes himself seriously and he wants people that name the name of the Lord to take him and his word seriously. And he says, whenever he speaks, whatever he says, he does not want a human being, whoever the human being may be, to add to his word, to diminish from his word, to take him seriously and just carry out the word as he has spoken the word. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, chapter 12, verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. 
thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from age. Here the Lord is saying, you have my word. And whatever it is, you read in my word. Whatever area of your life it affects, observe to do it. Obey the word of God without questioning, without argument. Know that he is God, you are a human being. He is great, you are small. He is the ancient of days, you are just a man or a woman of yesterday. Who am I to argue with God? Who are you to argue with God? God says, if you really want to worship me, stand upon my word and do not argue against my word. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add not thou unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We have always taught our people in this church that whatever we are in position, in rank, in education, in social circles, Whatever we are in the world, when we come to the church of the living God, we submit to the teaching of the word of God. Great and small, men and women, married and unmarried, workers and members. We have emphasized that over and over because of the respect we have for God, the honor we have for God, the reverence we have for God. And we have always instructed every word of God is pure. And whether we're coming from the university or we're coming from the market, the moment we come to the church, we submit totally to the teaching of the Word of God. We are not educated enough to change the Word of God. He is God. He knows what He's doing. He has eternity in His hand. And He determines where we're going to spend eternity. And He has told us, add not to His Word lest he reproves you and he will find you a liar now Paul the apostle was a person, a preacher that was called of God as he was called of God he was taught the word of God you know in, in the past before his conversion he had been a Pharisee and Pharisees had a lot of traditions the traditions of the elders Pharisees had a lot of false interpretations of the Sanhedrin. Pharisees had a lot of the things they stood upon which were not according to the word of God. But when that Paul saw, when he came to the Lord, the Lord started to teach him. And he changed his life, changed his attitude, changed his understanding, changed everything about him. Until he could declare to the churches that he taught in Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned, I have not neglected to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now I was such a man that has such reverence for God and for his word. And the Lord had sent him out. And he had gone about preaching the gospel in its fullness, in its power. And he demonstrated the power of the gospel. You know already that the spirit of God spoke in the church at Antioch. Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. For the work whereunto I have called them. And Barnabas and Saul went out. They got to a number of places, difficult places, demon invested places, 
Satan oppressed places, sickness filled places, and idolatrous places. But they went in the power of God because they were preaching the gospel, they were preaching that word of God in all sincerity, in its entirety, in its fullness. The Lord stood with them. Many, many souls were saved. Many, many people came to the Lord. Many lives were changed and miracles were wrought. The signs of apostleship followed after them. Everywhere Paul and Barnabas went, when they spoke against evil spirits, the evil spirits departed. When they laid their hands on the sick, the sick recovered. And when they called sinners to come to the Lord and bow the knee before the Lord and surrender themselves to the Lord, they were converted in their hundreds and thousands, multitudes. Now they came over after they finished the first missionary journey. They came to Antioch to settle down in the normal work of the church. But then they heard information that some people who too professed to be born again. They went to all the places where Paul the Apostle had been preaching and they started teaching those people another thing. Paul heard it. Of course, as a teacher of the word of God, as an apostle called and sent by God, as a man of God, calling them to all the conference centers, we might say, discussing with them, saying, Brethren, these things you are teaching, they are wrong. You are misleading the people. We have taught them the truth. What is this you are doing? They rebelled. They said, No, we are sorry. What we are teaching them is that. They must get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the same time, they must keep the whole law of Moses. They must be circumcised like all the Israelites. If they are not, they will never be saved. They must uh, go through all the things that were given to Moses. The things that Jesus abolished and cancelled on the cross of Calvary. If they don't, they cannot get to heaven. Paul said no. This Jesus you are talking about, you say you are born again. Have you ever heard his voice? Have you ever seen him? Have you ever really known him? I would have been standing for Moses like you are standing for Moses. But on the way to Damascus, I heard my name. He called my name. Nothing would have changed me. A man would not have been able to convince me. That Jesus Christ, they called my name. I looked up and I said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I said, what shall I do? Then he committed the gospel of the kingdom unto my hand. And he taught me from A to B to C to D to E, A to Z, the gospel doctrine in the Bible. I wasn't taught H by that man or that man or that man. They said, well, whatever experiences you've had with the Lord, that's your business. What we're teaching is, all the converts who have gone to, we want to tell them they must still keep the law of Moses. When this thing was out of hand, the churches determined, let's go to Jerusalem. There will be Peter, James, John, not the James who died in chapter 12. This is another James now. And then all the other apostles. And they came together to discuss, to finalize where they will have to stand. It was that serious. Now, listen to me. There are people that will ask us a question. Oh, they will say, there are still many people unsaved. Why don't we just reach out and forget all this business of doctrine? Because uh, many sinners are still there, they are waiting for us to be converted. Many sick people are there, they are waiting for us to be healed. Why come back and, you know, be talking about doctrine? My brother, my sister, if they didn't settle that problem at that time, we would have lost the gospel entirely. We would have been back in Judaism again. We would have been back in sacrificing animals again. We 
would have been barking depending upon circumcision and the laws of Moses for salvation. But they took time off. They said, we cannot continue even the evangelism. Even the missionary work, even every other thing, we cannot continue until we go to the headquarters in Jerusalem and we settle everything. If it, if it was that serious at that time, it is that serious today. Many people will say, oh, brother, we're waiting for you. I received many letters from many churches. And they're telling me, oh brother, this is not the age of doctrine. This is not the time to concentrate on teaching. You know, God has given deeper life the miraculous ministry. Let's join together. Let's forget doctrine. And let's all come together. All the pastors of gospel churches, all the priests of denominations, and deeper life and everybody, let's all come together and forget all this doctrine. You know, there are so many sinners uh, not born again yet. There are so many sick people. Let's join our efforts together and pray to them so that they can be born again. That's all right. But let's settle the doctrine. How are we saved? After we are saved, what life do we live? How about the cardinal doctrines of the Bible? Oh, they will say, well, uh, God will teach them. Well, God will not teach them. God has given us the teachers to teach them. That's why we're spending time. And there may be people here today that are saying, uh -uh, why all this uh, waste of time? And we have to settle that Monday Bible study and talk about settling doctrinal disputes. Why all the waste of time? After all, there is no difficulty, there is no division in deeper life. Thank God that in deeper life, all our zonal leaders, the coordinator, the area leaders, they stand by the doctrine of the word of God. We thank God for it. But we're not going to wait until somebody rises up somewhere to cause trouble on doctrine before we begin to teach you the word of God and I've said if you are pastors here I praise the Lord for you but you came here to learn something in fact you know pastor if you are there let me tell you this the reason this church is growing the reason you have seen the miracles you have seen in a church like this is because we are very very serious in the word of God and if other churches as well because this God is a wonderful God. It's not just the God of deeper life. You have some young people that come here to testify and they say, Oh, the God of Bagada, when they're excited. No, no. It's not just the God of Bagada. It's not just the God of deeper life. It's everybody's God. And if in other churches, whatever the name of that church, if they will stand on the same word of God, and be serious of the word of God and apply the word of God to their lives and everything they do. The same miracles that are taking place here, the same miracles will take place there. But if they are not serious of the word of God, God cannot be wasting his time with people that will not take him serious. So that's why today we're spending time. We're not wasting time. Are we wasting time? We're spending time to make sure that you understand the fundamental foundational truth. And after understanding, then you can reach out by the grace of God, of the word of God, and help other people. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse, from verse 1, And certain men, which came from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and, Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question. My brothers and sisters, false doctrine brings confusion. Paul and Barnabas had taught the people but these brethren, they were saved. They too, they were born again. But they were Jews. But the fact is that they had been in a sect before they became saved. After they became saved, they said, 
everything they were doing with Moses before, they still wanted to continue. And they wanted to put that on other people. Now listen to me. We have come from various backgrounds. I'm sure there are people here that you are now saved. You are now a child of God. Perhaps you are even a house fellowship leader. But before you were saved, you were a Jehovah's Witness. There are people here, you are born again, you are saved. Before you were saved, maybe you were going to Seventh-day Adventist Church, where they tell us that you must still keep all the laws of Moses. And you must keep the Sabbath. You must worship on Saturday. If you don't, you will receive the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. That's what they say. Maybe you are saved, you are born again, you are now in deeper life. But you, you are coming from the celestial church. Or you are coming from Cherubim and Seraphim. And before you pray, you must light a candle. You must remove your shoes. You must wear white garment. Now you are born again. Now you are a child of God. Perhaps you are even now a worker in the church. But maybe unfortunately, you are still holding on to the Jehovah's Witnesses teaching after you are born again. Not only holding on to it, you are going to other people that except they do this and do that, which you were taught many years ago, these people cannot be saved. Or you are telling some of our members in the church, and you are saying, well, uh, I am now in deeper life, I am born again now, but except uh, we come to worship on Saturday, we cannot totally have favor with God. And you confuse people. You know, if we hear that, We'll have to call you and say, what is this you are teaching? That's what happened at that time. These people that were Pharisees, now born again, they didn't give up everything that they had before. They had Christ on one hand, and they were holding on to Moses on the other hand. And so, when they couldn't finalize everything, when they were rebellious, incorrigible, they said, okay, let's go to Jerusalem. In verse 3, being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. You know, the innocent brethren, when they had the testimonies of what God had done through Paul, through Barnabas, they rejoiced. Oh, they said, that is wonderful. The Gentiles are getting saved. And you can be sure, every time that Paul the Apostle told the testimony of people getting saved, he will tell them, without circumcision, without keeping the law of Moses, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are getting saved. These innocent brethren, they rejoice, but the troublemakers will never rejoice. The troublemakers will sit back and say, hey, well, they are getting saved. They are throwing away their idols. Their lives are changing, their characters changing, everything changing about them, but they are not circumcised. They are not keeping the law of Moses. They are not doing it, they are not looking at the Sabbath, uh, you know, problem. And uh, except they do that, they cannot be totally saved. So that means there are three groups. The Gentiles who are never born again, the Jews who are born again, then the Gentiles who are born again but not circumcised. And these brethren are saying they are not complete Christians because they are not keeping the law of Moses. That means there are two doors. The door of faith and the door of the law. These people have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have opened the door of faith. They have entered. But there is another inner door of circumcision. Except they open that one, they will not get into the center of the real church, of the building. You know, sometimes uh, you have a house like that. If you've been at the place I counsel. Now, you open the first door, you sit down. But really where I am, there is another door leading to that place. Faith has brought you into the first room. But you cannot really have communion with the pastor. Um, exhortation from the pastor you cannot have the counseling from the pastor except to go through that second door now that's what they were doing they had a door of faith they entered in but they were still at the premises of the kingdom these false teachers were telling them except you will now open the other law the other door of the law of Moses you will never be able to really get into the center 
And Paul the apostle was saying, no, there is only one way. There is only one door. There is only one truth. There is only one name. There is only one savior. There is only one mediator. And once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, without keeping the law of Moses, without being circumcised, without rituals, without sacrament, without any other thing, you can be saved. They said no. In verse 4. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and of the elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. Certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The law of Moses. What to eat, what not to eat. Clean animal, unclean animal. How to plant your vineyard, not to mix the crops together. All the things that they taught in all those Old Testament, in the Old Testament, symbolizing, picturing, typifying the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the acceptable sacrifice. After that, Jesus had died for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And all those things had been abolished. These people were still saying, no, we don't accept that Jesus is the only way. That just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is the final thing, is the total thing. That they must still be circumcised, number one. Not only circumcised, they must keep the whole law of Moses. That was the thing that they had dissension upon. And in our church, I told you last Monday, if a thing like that happens, you as church members, you ought to understand where to stand. Here you are worshipping God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God because since we started, we have not had too many problems on doctrine. The people coming here, they have made up their minds that as long as we're teaching them the whole truth, the balanced truth from the word of God, they are going to stand with the truth of the word of God. But we're young. We don't know when Jesus will come. If Jesus tarries and anybody rises up and says, no, sanctification is not possible. Nobody can live a holy life might be a zonal leader, might be an area leader, might be a house fellowship leader, state representative, anyone. You ought to know as a member of the church what attitude to have. Now you ought to understand within the church that what is keeping the church is our stand on the word of God. And by the grace of God, we're going to keep on standing on the word of God in Jesus' name. Now... Other churches have always had problems with us on a stand like this. But we are worshipping God, we are not worshipping men. We are not looking for the approval of other churches. I'm not looking for any church in town, any church, whatever the name of the church, whatever the name of the pastor. I'm not looking for any church to say, oh, Brother Kumuyi is doing well. When they begin to pray, so you are backsliding. You stand on the word of God as a zonal leader, as an area leader. Now, they might say, oh, if uh, deeper life will not change all the things they're teaching, if they make a program, we're not going to come to that program. Good luck to you. It's the Holy Spirit that is bringing people to programs. If that program originates from God, if that program is sanctioned by God, if that program is something that God himself has given to be organized by the church here, there is no human being anywhere in Lagos, in Nigeria, or in Africa that can stop the move of the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't come, it will mean that you are rejecting the truth. Because you hate the truth, you don't want to come. And maybe you are able to convince some people who love unrighteousness not to come 
In fact, we do not even want people to come to any program we organize if those people are not going to stand on the word of God we're teaching them. Spend a lot of money and spend energy, do everything, and then the people that are there are just uh, the people that will not uh, want to listen to the word of God. We don't want people like that to come to our programs. And if they only turn in that program, God will work for them. We're not looking for, you know, we're used to having, you know, thousands of people in a retreat, but if there are 10 people there, we teach them the truth. If there are 100 people there, we teach them the truth. You see, we're looking for people that will stand on the word of God. And I thank God that you are here today. Because you listened to what I preached last Monday. And for you to come back today, I'm sure you are looking for something. Because uh, hearing what you heard last Monday, if you are not really looking for something, you wouldn't come back. Am I right? But thank God, we're looking for the truth. And we have discovered the truth. And we're not going to sell the truth in Jesus' name. So this was the dissension, the difficulty that they had. Now, the discussion in verse 6. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when they had been, they had been much disputing, much argument, much opposition and discussion, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know. How that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles, now as they were discussing. The argument was hot. The disputation was much. The disagreement was apparent, manifest before them. Peter was watching them. He sat down. He looked at the pros and the cons. Paul stood up and said, Brethren, these people are getting saved. They are having the joy of salvation. God is healing them. Wonderful things are taking place. They are throwing their idols away. They are making restitution. They are readjusting their marriages. Everything is showing that they have really repented. Why are we telling them to circumcise again and keep the law of Moses? When what the law of Moses could not do, the grace and the faith and the blood of Jesus is doing, they are doing it. The other people said, oh yes, we know what you are saying. But what you are saying is that they must still be circumcised. If they are not, whatever change may take place, whatever miracle they may see, whatever uh, may transformation may happen in their lives, it is not complete. After all, Peter, the apostle, he rose up. And he said, brethren, listen to me. You know, I learned something here. The argument was going on, the discussion was going on, everything was going on. The moment Peter an apostle sent and commissioned by Christ himself a person that has known to be in leadership in that church the moment he rose up and he said pay attention Paul kept quiet Barnabas kept quiet even the believers who were of the sect of the Pharisees before, they kept quiet. Every other person kept quiet. Now, in our church here, 
Peter has gone. Peter is not here. I am not Peter. I am not Paul. But by the grace of God, you have a pastor. We have zonal leaders. We have area leaders. We have coordinator. We have workers. If you are discussing something on doctrine, and this one will talk, this one will talk, this one will talk, this one will talk, and you don't know where you stand, the moment the general superintendent rises up and he says, now listen to what I want to say. If it is a church whose foundation is on the Lord Jesus Christ, whose directives are coming from the Holy Bible, whose understanding of leadership in the church is out of the leadership in the Bible. The moment the general superintendent rises up to say, now listen to me, everybody should keep quiet. Am I right? If there is an individual that is saying, no, I'm sorry, I have a point. It's a backslider. Our missionaries, wherever they are, America, let me listen to this cassette. Britain, anywhere in Africa, if they have any difficulty on doctrine, and they discuss this way, they discuss this way, maybe they come back home, we call them for missionary conference, they come back home, and they are discussing this way and discussing this way. The moment the general superintendent tries this up and he says, now, missionaries, listen. If they are real missionaries in this church, if they have not lost the grace of humility, that time they should keep quiet. They should listen. Because after all, when they came to the church, they didn't come to the church as missionaries. Many of those missionaries of deeper life, wherever they are, London, America, Asia, Africa, Many of them did not understand holiness until they came to this church. And all the cardinal, serious, important, essential truths they knew, they knew in this church. And the teacher is greater than the student. The leader is greater than the member of the congregation. And when I ask the teacher, as your pastor, when I rise up and I say, this is the truth, if you are still in grace, if you are still having the Lord, if the Lord is still living in you, you ought to keep quiet and listen. And so Paul, uh, Peter the Apostle, he rose up and he said, now listen to me. He, he taught them about the past event and about the past history. He said, brethren, have you forgotten that some time ago God used me, your apostle, to go to Cornelius, a Gentile. And while I was talking to that Cornelius, a Gentile, and to the household and the many people that were there, God himself made a wonderful thing. When they heard the word at my, in my mouth, and God knew their hearts, and he bore them witness, and he gave them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, they were not circumcised. And yet, as I began to speak to them, the Holy Ghost came upon them. They spoke in tongues. They magnified the Lord. Brethren, let's remember. Why are we tempting God? Why are we adding something that is not there again? Why are we bringing the new covenant under the old covenant? We believe that through grace, grace unmerited, grace abundant, through grace, of the Lord Jesus Christ without Moses we shall be saved as Jews even as they verse 12 then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul declaring the miracles and the wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them before they shut up Barnabas and Paul they won't allow them to relate all the miracles that were taking place, all the signs and the wonders that were taking place, in the heat of the argument. But when Peter spoke, 
All those um, false teachers, they felt sorry. They kept quiet. And Peter said, now, Barnabas and Paul, tell us more. What God is doing among those Gentiles, by grace, by faith alone, without circumcision, without the keeping of the law, and they listen. Now listen to me. I'm teaching you all this so that you will understand what to do. Sometimes we have a few people that do not understand the word of God very well. Just some months ago, somebody wrote to me and said that uh, he had left deeper life and convinced his wife convinced his children and they all left as a family and um, said we're leaving because we do not believe that we should be worshipping on Sunday we believe that we should be worshipping on Saturday and we have been coming since 1983 about three years hoping that deeper life will eventually come back to the law of Moses and be worshipping on Saturday. But because we have waited and waited and waited from 83 to 84 to 85, now we have made up our minds, we're leaving the church. And then they said, if you want to see us to discuss with us, you can uh, send to us through the Zona leader. That's an insult on the pastor. If you know that you wanted to discuss such a point, if you know that this pastor here is a man of God, if you know that this pastor here is a person that will spend hours in the day, hours in the night, on his knees, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, communicating with God, if you knew that this pastor here is a person that wants to, does say the Lord alone, and you had that respect for the pastor here, before you leave, you will come and say, Brother, I am confused about this. Can you help me? Not that you would have left and then send a letter to me and saying if you need us, if you want to discuss, you can send to us. That's disrespectful. Disrespectful. And you know, you as a member of the church, you ought to understand how to have respect for your pastor. Uh, respect for the pastor is not just putting your hands at the back saying, yes sir, yes sir. That one is uh, traditional hypocrisy. You know, people that will say yes sir, yes sir They'll never obey what you're saying they never stand by the word of God But they just meet you and put their head on the ground Almost touching the ground saying yes sir No, that's no respect for the pastor The greatest respect you can give to a man of God Is obeying and accepting the word of God that he's teaching you Do you understand? Now There are people in the past there was an individual, one of our workers some years ago. He disagreed with the doctrine of sanctification. Oh, he said, no, I don't accept. And yet the Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Jesus said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them whom you have given to me. Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. And this Jesus Christ, that he may sanctify the people, he suffered without the gauge. And he will not accept sanctification. I called him, I said, brother, what is all this? I've taught you myself. In public Bible study, in private Bible study, this was a person, when he was converted, I would give him extra time to teach him the word of God. But... Eventually he said, oh no, I'm sorry. He'd be reading books. Books you buy from the roadside. Books you buy from the market. And uh, he rebelled and said, no, I'm sorry. I don't believe that it's uh, necessary as a definite work of grace. I said, well, if, like, if it's like that, you cannot continue to be a worker. He said, all right. Then after a few weeks, he bought a car and sent his driver to give me that car. I told the driver, go and give him the car. Tell him to come and see me. That's not respect for the pastor. What am I going to do with car? Do you think a, the pastor here needs money? He needs a car. He needs a palace for you to build somewhere. What am I looking for? All that I'm looking for is your obedience to the word of God. 
if we disobey the word of God and then we go to a corner, we go and buy a car for the pastor. Why we're disobeying the word of God? Is that respect for the pastor? No. The greatest thing you can do for your pastor, for the man of God, is that when you are taught the word of God, you stand by that word of God. You influence other people in your family, in your community, to stand by that word of God. It is only then that we are really working together. I am happy that we are missed people that really love the word of God. You love the word of God. Don't you? I'm sure you love the word of God. You wouldn't have been here, uh, you know, yesterday and then come again today. And you are coming on Thursday again. Am I right? Yes. You wouldn't be coming like that if you don't love the word of God. All the changes that are happening in your life, those changes will not be happening if you do not love the word of God. But my brothers and sisters, let us stand on the word of God. All the teaching of the Bible, let us stand by age. We don't know when Jesus will come. Listen to me now. If Jesus tarries and this pastor here grows old and I die and I go to be with the Lord, whoever is taking over as the next general superintendent, when I'm in heaven and I'm looking down, because you know, when you are in heaven, you'll know everything that is going on. You'll be perfect in knowledge. The thing that will cause joy in my heart is that we are still standing on the word of God. But if we mix everything up, dilute everything, destroy everything, modify everything, no pastor will be happy. So you don't know what you'll be tomorrow. You may be a pastor tomorrow in deeper life. You may be a zonal leader tomorrow in deeper life. Whatever the Lord will make of you tomorrow, my brothers and sisters, let us stand by the word of God. We may send you out to become a state representative, stand by the word of God. We may send you out to become a missionary somewhere, stand by the word of God, so that anywhere it is, when we get there on supervision, we'll be able to say, oh, we praise the Lord. It's the same truth. But if you go out as a worker in deeper life, and all you do is just make noise, walk miracle, heal the sick, and you are not standing on the word of God. And then the people, they don't know they are led from their right. Any evangelist that comes to town can easily deceive them. That will not be solid work. By the grace of God, we are going to do solid work. And you in your own involvement as a zonal leader, as an area leader, as a house fellowship leader, members of the choir, or ushers, Stand for the word of God anywhere you are. And if people come to you to confuse you, to destroy the things you are learning, the things you are hearing, you must be able to say, no, this is where I stand. Look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Avoid them. Now, a person that is looking for the praise of the people of the world, religious leaders, other pastors will not be talking as I'm talking to you. Because I know what the other people want. They want me to soft pedal. They want me to just, you know, group together with every other person. But you see, we have a serious work to do. And the Bible says, you mark them. Preachers, evangelists, pastors, anyone mark them which cause divisions contrary to the things which you have learned and the bible says pointedly directly avoid them if this church ever gets into any unity with a group of churches it will be on the basis of the doctrines of the bible but where well, the preachers will say it doesn't matter how many wives you marry doesn't matter whether you are holy or not doesn't matter whether this happens or not i'll be the last pastor to stand with such people. And I tell them, those pastors, whenever we have opportunities and we discuss together, this is a pastor that doesn't fear either police or preacher. 
This is a person that fears neither death nor suffering. This is an individual that neither fears criticism or opposition because I stand for the word of God. As long as all the other pastors will stand on the word of God together, oh yes, we're going on. We'll unite. We'll love one another. We'll preach together. We'll have fellowship together. But if they deviate from that word, that's what I tell them. And we cannot stand on the words of the Bible. I will be the last person. You can go over the radio and announce my name and say I'm not a good person. That's your business. I'm going to stand on the word of God. And this whole church, this whole church, with all the branches all over Nigeria and all over Africa, we are standing on that same word of God. They will abuse you like they're abusing me. The more they abuse me, the stronger I am. They will oppose you like they oppose me. The more they abuse you, the more matured you become. Because God says, I will make your mouth a threshing instrument. That when you open your mouth, I will fill you. The wisdom you didn't have before, you will have that wisdom. When you are standing on the word of God, these are the last days. Many, many people are deviating. Many, many people are compromising. But this is your own time to stand on the word of God. It says in verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. In Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Are we going to do that? Look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man... Any man, any man. You know, many times when people are preaching, they will say, according to Dr. So-and-so, according to Professor So-and-so. And they think whenever they say that, that is the end. The professor that is uh, remarried, divorced his first wife and remarried, according to Professor So-and-so. According to Evangelist So-and-so, the evangelist that is not standing on the total truth of the word of God, who are we deceiving? The word of God says, if any man, a professor, a doctor, you know, in Nigeria, all the evangelists that have not seen the inside of a university, everyone is reverend doctor, reverend doctor. Some of them are professors. Just title. But you know, if you are standing on the word of God, it doesn't matter whether they just call you brother or mister. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a professor. Just carrying about names and titles. But you get down on your knees as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a teacher, and study this word of God. Eat the word of God. Take in the word of God. Stand on the word of God. And God will back you up. Peter was not a professor. Paul was not Dr. Paul. Where have we seen all this thing we're carrying about? Hey, Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so. Certificates that matter, that doesn't matter in the sight of God. What matters in the sight of God is obedience to the word of God. And it says if any man, professor or doctor, anybody, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's the word of the Lord. You fear the judgment of God. Stand on the word of God. Area leader, don't add anything to the word of God. Zona leader, don't add anything to the word of God. Stand by the word. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. And it's in the word of God. I won't accept this. And it's in the word of God. No, if I do that one, my church will not agree with me. And that thing is in the word of God. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. My brothers and sisters, I have taught you the truth. 
And I've taught you in such a way that you will not misunderstand what I'm saying. I mean, very, very clear, very, very definite that as children of God, as members of this church, stand on the word of God. And please, if any pastor comes to you and he says, bring all the zones to a particular fellowship of evangelists and they have seen Brother Kumui and he has agreed to that, don't do anything until you check off from me. Because uh, we, whatever we stand for, we stand on it. When I see them, I tell them, all that I'm telling you now, in fact, I'll be happy if they hear this cassette that, you know, we're preaching so that they would be able to go on their knees as I go on my knees as well to become more devoted to the word of God. And I'm willing to help as many pastors as really want the truth, but we cannot compromise in this church. And zonal leader, you cannot take the members of the zone to any association. If you don't hear from the pastor here, area leader, house fellowship leaders, you cannot distribute anything in the house fellowship or in the church here belonging to people you don't know their lives, you don't know their doctrine, you don't know what they're doing without cross-checking from the headquarters church here. That's what we stand on. I never tell another pastor to support me if he doesn't know what I stand upon. I never take money from anybody to organize a program if he doesn't know what I stand upon. I never take anything. I will say, no, you don't know what you are supporting. Why are you supporting me? You don't know my life. You don't know my doctrine. I want you to know what I teach first before you will ever support. That's the same thing I want other people to do. I want to understand what they are teaching first before I support them. Once I understand and I see it is according to the word of God, oh, he's my brother, he's my, she's my sister, we'll work together. And the same attitude we all have in this church. Do you have that attitude? Is this thing too difficult for you, what I'm teaching you tonight? Are you in agreement with the word of God? I believe God will bless us as we stand on the word of God. Let's rise up and pray. Stand on the word of God. Don't let anybody intimidate you, make you afraid. Man is not going to judge you on the last day. Your judgment is in the hand of the almighty God. Stand on the word. Stay with the word. Keep to the word of God. Ever compromise, stand on the word of God.